it is an honor, a privilege to be sharing this time of prayer and meditation with all of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for admitting me here. Now, normally when you meet a grandchild, you expect a young person. <laughs> this grandson of Gandhi is a mere 87 year old man. So Gandhi, of course, lived a very long time ago. Uh, it is widely known that Gandhi tried very hard, as hard as anyone else, maybe even harder, against two very great weaknesses in India. One was the sin, you might say, the crime of untouchability. And the other was the need for Hindu-Muslim friendship. So Gandhi is known for these two efforts, gallant efforts on his part, and, uh, and of course for India's freedom from British imperial rule. But here is what Gandhi himself has related about his childhood, his boyhood. Uh, so this is based on his own recollections. When he was hardly yet 12, his mother, who was a very devout person, a lady called Putli Bai, told him that he was not to touch a boy called Uka, who was an untouchable boy, who used to come to the lavatory of the Gandhi family home in Rajkot to clean it. Don't touch him. Mohan, don't touch Uka. Why not? No, you're not supposed to touch him. If you touch him, you should have a cleansing bath. And what if I can't immediately have a bath if I touch Uka or somebody else like Uka on my way to school because there are many untouchable boys on the way and even in school. Listen to this now, what his mother told him when he was 12. If you could not have a bath immediately, one way to cancel the unholy touch was to touch any Muslim passing boy. The second pollution would remove the first. One pollution would remove the other pollution. So this is the background to the man who fought harder than anyone to remove the sin, the crime, the shame of untouchability and to restore Muslim-Hindu friendship and partnership. I was 11 years old myself, four months before India's independence, in April of 1947, when I heard my grandfather speak to hundreds of Asian leaders who were assembled in the 16th century Purana Kela, the old fort in India's capital city, to discuss Asia's future role. Since an American journalist recorded Gandhi's remarks, we can hear them today in Gandhi's own voice. But I was there myself, I heard this, these remarks. Telling the assembly that any future gathering should contain representatives of Africa's exploited races also. Then Gandhi said, all the Asian representatives have come together is it in order to wage a war against Europe, against America, against non-Asians? I say most emphatically, no. Then he recalled in chronological order, Zoroaster, Buddha, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Gandhi said that those figures were Asia's wise men. 
He added, I am an inheritor of the message of love that, re that these great unconquerable teachers left for us. I want you to go away with the thought that Asia has to conquer the West through love and truth. You will complete the conquest of the West, not through vengeance, because you've been exploited, but with real understanding. This conquest will be loved by the West itself. When Gandhi was in South Africa, from the age of 23 to the age of 44, in the year 1908, in Johannesburg, he made the following remarks. In his speech, Gandhi specified the different races living in South Africa, the Africans, the Indians, the Chinese who were living in South Africa and the so-called colored race, which unlike in the United States, was the term that South Africans used and still use for the country's mixed blood community and the whites of South Africa. And this is what Gandhi said in 1908 in a speech published in the newspapers in Johannesburg at the time. When the British occupied India, it was not owing to humanitarian grounds. The act was selfish and often tinged with dishonesty. But nature often produces good out of evil. I am a loyal subject of the empire, said Gandhi in 1908. But I hope I'm not a member of a subject race. I trust it is the mission of the English race, even where there are subject races, to raise them to equality with themselves, to give them free institutions and make them absolutely free. Then added Gandhi, and this is the sentence I want us to remember, in 1908, in Johannesburg in South Africa, if we look into the future, is it not a heritage we have to leave to posterity that all the different races commingle and produce a civilization that perhaps the world has not yet seen? 1908 in Johannesburg, South Africa. Do I have three minutes more? This is a personal story. I was 16 years old in New Delhi. Uh, my father was the editor of a newspaper and our apartment was in the same building where the newspaper was prepared, produced, printed. And one morning a young reporter came up to the apartment where we were, my father was at home. And he knocked on the door, I opened the door, he was carrying with him a piece of paper. And the piece of paper was torn off the teleprinter where the news of the day would come in, in those days, I'm talking about 1951. And this piece of paper, I read it as he came in and I let him in. The piece of paper said, Liaquat Ali Khan, Prime Minister of Pakistan, has been shot, MTF. I knew what MTF meant, more to follow. And listen to this. I, 16 year old, say to this young reporter, I hope what follows is the news that he is dead. I expected a smile from him Thank God he gave me a frown. And I realized that I had said something stupid. Later, as I reflected upon it, much later, I realized that my stupidity, my horrible remark, came from two factors. One, I'd imbibed 
local prejudice. Pakistanis in black Indians, Indians in black Pakistanis. But secondly, I was a boy trying to be a macho man. So that realization at my horrible remark was part of the engine that drove me to work for reconciliation between Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Jews, atheists, all races, all nationalities, people of all faiths. And this is what has brought me to this wonderful space. Thank you very much.